The First Battle of Bull Run the name used by Union forces, also known as the First Battle of Manassas the name used by Confederate forces, was fought on July 21, 1861 in Prince William County, Virginia, just north of the city of Manassas and about 25 miles west-southwest of Washington, D.C. It was the first major battle of the American Civil War. The Union's forces were slow in positioning themselves, allowing Confederate reinforcements time to arrive by rail. Each side had about 18,000 poorly trained and poorly led troops in their first battle. It was a Confederate victory, followed by a disorganized retreat of the Union forces. Just months after the start of the war at Fort Sumter, the northern public clamored for a march against the Confederate capital of Richmond, Virginia, which was expected to bring an early end to the rebellion. Yielding to political pressure, Brig. General Irvin McDowell led his unseasoned Union Army across Bull Run against the equally inexperienced Confederate Army of Brig. Gen. P.G.T. Beauregard camped near Manassas Junction. McDowell's ambitious plan for a surprise flank attack on the Confederate left was poorly executed by his officers and men. Nevertheless, the Confederates, who had been planning to attack the Union left flank, found themselves at an initial disadvantage. Confederate reinforcements under Brig. General Joseph E. Johnston arrived from the Shenandoah Valley by railroad, and the course of the battle quickly changed. A brigade of Virginians under the relatively unknown Brigadier General from the Virginia Military Institute, Thomas J. Jackson, stood its ground, which resulted in Jackson receiving his famous nickname, Stonewall. The Confederates launched a strong counterattack, and as the Union troops began withdrawing under fire, many panicked and the retreat turned into a rout. McDowell's men frantically ran without order in the direction of Washington, D.C. Both armies were sobered by the fierce fighting and many casualties, and realized that the war was going to be much longer and bloodier than either had anticipated. The Battle of First Bull Run highlighted many of the problems and deficiencies that were typical of the first year of the war. Units were committed piecemeal, attacks were frontal, infantry failed to protect exposed artillery, tactical intelligence was nil, and neither commander was able to employ his whole force effectively. McDowell, with 35,000 men, was only able to commit about 18,000, and the combined Confederate forces, with about 32,000 men, committed only 18,000. Background. Military and political situation On April 15, 1861, the day after South Carolina military forces attacked and captured Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, President Abraham Lincoln issued a proclamation declaring an insurrection against the laws of the United States. Earlier, South Carolina and seven other Southern states had declared their secession from the Union and formed the Confederate States of America. To suppress the rebellion and restore federal law in the southern states, Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers with 90-day enlistments to augment the existing U.S. Army of about 15,000. He later accepted an additional 40,000 volunteers with three-year enlistments and increased the strength of the U.S. Army to almost 20,000. Lincoln's actions caused four more southern states, including Virginia, to secede and join the Confederacy, and by 1 June the Confederate capital had been moved from Montgomery, Alabama, to Richmond, Virginia. In Washington, D.C., as thousands of volunteers rushed to defend the capital, General-in-Chief Lt. Gen. Winfield Scott laid out his strategy to subdue the rebellious states. He proposed that an army of 80,000 men be organized and sail down the Mississippi River and capture New Orleans. While the army strangled the Confederacy in the West, the U.S. Navy would blockade southern ports along the eastern and Gulf coasts. The press ridiculed what they dubbed as Scott's Anaconda Plan. Instead, many believed the capture of the Confederate capital at Richmond, only 100 miles south of Washington, would quickly end the war. By July 1861 thousands of volunteers were camped in and around Washington. Since General Scott was 75 years old and physically unable to lead this force, the administration searched for a more suitable field commander. Irvin McDowell Secretary of the Treasury Salmon P. Chase championed fellow Ohioan, 42-year-old Maj. Irvin McDowell. 
Although McDowell was a West Point graduate, his command experience was limited. In fact, he had spent most of his career engaged in various staff duties in the Adjutant General's office. While stationed in Washington he had become acquainted with Chase, a former Ohio governor and senator. Now, through Chase's influence, McDowell was promoted three grades to Brigadier General in the regular army and on 27 May was assigned command by President Abraham Lincoln of the Department of Northeastern Virginia, which included the military forces in and around Washington Army of Northeastern Virginia. McDowell immediately began organizing what became known as the Army of Northeastern Virginia, 35,000 men arranged in five divisions. Under public and political pressure to begin offensive operations, McDowell was given very little time to train the newly inducted troops. Units were instructed in the maneuvering of regiments, but they received little or no training at the brigade or division level. He was reassured by President Lincoln, You are green, it is true, but they are green also, you are all green alike. Against his better judgment, McDowell commenced campaigning. Intelligence During the previous year, U.S. Army Captain Thomas Jordan set up a pro-Southern spy network in Washington City, including Rose O'Neill Greenhow, a prominent socialite with a wide range of contacts. He provided her with a code for messages. After he left to join the Confederate Army, he gave her control of his network but continued to receive reports from her. On July 9 and 16, 1861, Greenhow passed secret messages to Confederate General P.G.T. Beauregard containing critical information regarding military movements for what would be the first Battle of Bull Run, including the plans of Union General McDowell. <laughs> McDowell's plan and initial movements in the Manassas Campaign On July 16, 1861, McDowell departed Washington with the largest field army yet gathered on the North American continent, about 35,000 men 28,452 effectives. McDowell's plan was to move westward in three columns and make a diversionary attack on the Confederate line at Bull Run with two columns, while the third column moved around the Confederates' right flank to the south, cutting the railroad to Richmond and threatening the rear of the Confederate army. He assumed that the Confederates would be forced to abandon Manassas Junction and fall back to the Rappahannock River, the next defensible line in Virginia, which would relieve some of the pressure on the U.S. Capitol. McDowell had hoped to have his army at Centerville by 17 July, but the troops, unaccustomed to marching, moved in starts and stops. Along the route soldiers often broke ranks to wander off to pick apples or blackberries or to get water, regardless of the orders of their officers to remain in ranks. The Confederate Army of the Potomac 21,883 effectives under Beauregard was encamped near Manassas Junction, approximately 25 miles 40 kilometers from the United States Capitol. McDowell planned to attack this numerically inferior enemy army. Union Maj. Gen. Robert Patterson's 18,000 men engaged Johnston's force the Army of the Shenandoah at 8,884 effectives, augmented by Maj. Gen. Theophilus H. Holmes's brigade of 1,465 in the Shenandoah Valley, preventing them from reinforcing Beauregard. After two days of marching slowly in the sweltering heat, the Union Army was allowed to rest in Centerville. McDowell reduced the size of his army to approximately 31,000 by dispatching Brig. Gen. Theodore Runyon with 5,000 troops to protect the army's rear. In the meantime, McDowell searched for a way to outflank Beauregard, who had drawn up his lines along Bull Run. On July 18, the Union commander sent a division under Brig. General Daniel Tyler to pass on the Confederate right southeast flank. Tyler was drawn into a skirmish at Blackburn's Ford over Bull Run and made no headway. Also on the morning of 18 July Johnston had received a telegram suggesting he go to Beauregard's assistance if possible. Johnston marched out of Winchester about noon, while Stuart's cavalry screened the movement from Patterson. Patterson was completely deceived. One hour after Johnston's departure Patterson telegraphed Washington. I have succeeded, in accordance with the wishes of the General-in-Chief, in keeping General Johnston's force at Winchester. For the maneuver to be successful McDowell felt he needed to act quickly. He had already begun to hear rumors that Johnston had slipped out of the valley and was headed for Manassas Junction. 
If the rumors were true, McDowell might soon be facing 34,000 Confederates, instead of 22,000. Another reason for quick action was McDowell's concern that the 90-day enlistments of many of his regiments were about to expire. In a few days I will lose many thousands of the best of this force. He wrote Washington on the eve of battle. In fact, the next morning two units of McDowell's command, their enlistments expiring that day, would turn a deaf ear to McDowell's appeal to stay a few days longer. Instead, to the sounds of battle, they would march back to Washington to be mustered out of service. Becoming more frustrated, McDowell resolved to attack the Confederate left northwest flank instead. He planned to attack with Brig. General Daniel Tyler's division at the Stone Bridge on the Warrenton Turnpike and send the divisions of Brig. Jens, David Hunter and Samuel P. Heintzelman over Sudley Springs Ford. From here, these divisions could march into the Confederate rear. The Brigade of Call. Israel B. Richardson Tyler's division would harass the enemy at Blackburn's Ford, preventing them from thwarting the main attack. Patterson would tie down Johnston in the Shenandoah Valley so that reinforcements could not reach the area. Although McDowell had arrived at a theoretically sound plan, it had a number of flaws. It was one that required synchronized execution of troop movements and attacks, skills that had not been developed in the nascent army. It relied on actions by Patterson that he had already failed to take. Finally, McDowell had delayed long enough that Johnston's Valley Force was able to board trains at Piedmont Station and rush to Manassas Junction to reinforce Beauregard's men. Prelude to battle On July 19-20, significant reinforcements bolstered the Confederate lines behind Bull Run. Johnston arrived with all of his army, except for the troops of Brig. General Kirby Smith, who were still in transit. Most of the new arrivals were posted in the vicinity of Blackburn's Ford, and Beauregard's plan was to attack from there to the north toward Centerville. Johnston, the senior officer, approved the plan. If both of the armies had been able to execute their plans simultaneously, it would have resulted in a mutual counterclockwise movement as they attacked each other's left flank. McDowell was getting contradictory information from his intelligence agents, so he called for the balloon enterprise, which was being demonstrated by Professor Thaddeus S. C. Lowe in Washington, to perform aerial reconnaissance. Topic: <laughs> Opposing forces. Topic. Union McDowell's Army of Northeastern Virginia was organized into five infantry divisions of three to five brigades each. Each brigade contained three to five infantry regiments. An artillery battery was generally assigned to each brigade. The total number of Union troops present at the Battle of First Bull Run was about 35,000, although only about 18,000 were actually engaged. The Union Army was organized as follows 1st Division of Brig. General Daniel Tyler the largest in the army, contained four brigades, led by Brig. General Robert C. Schenck, Col. Erasmus Keyes, Col. William T. Sherman, and Col. Israel B. Richardson. 2nd Division of Colonel David Hunter of two brigades. These were led by Cols. Andrew Porter and Ambrose E. Burnside. 3rd Division of Col. Samuel P. Heinzelman included three brigades, led by Calls. William B. Franklin, Orlando B. Wilcox, and Oliver O. Howard. Fourth Division of Brig. Gen. Theodore Runyon without brigade organization and not engaged, contained seven regiments of New Jersey and one regiment of New York Volunteer Infantries. Fifth Division of Call. Dixon S. Miles included two brigades, commanded by Calls, Louis Blenker and Thomas A. Davies, while McDowell organized the Army of Northeastern Virginia, a smaller Union command was organized and stationed northwest of Washington, near Harper's Ferry. Commanded by Maj. Gen. Robert Patterson, 18,000 men of the Department of Pennsylvania protected against a Confederate incursion from the Shenandoah Valley. Abstract from the Returns of the Department of Northeastern Virginia, commanded by Brigadier General McDowell, USA, for July 16 and 17, 1861. Abstract from Return of the Department of Pennsylvania, commanded by Major General Patterson, June 28, 1861. Topic: <laughs> Confederate. 
The Army of the Potomac Brig. Gen. PGT Beauregard, commanding, was organized into six infantry brigades, with each brigade containing three to six infantry regiments. Artillery batteries were assigned to various infantry brigades. The total number of troops in the Confederate Army of the Potomac was approximately 22,000. Beauregard's army also contained 39 pieces of field artillery and a regiment of Virginia cavalry. The Army of the Potomac was organized into seven infantry brigades. These were 1st Brigade, under Brig. Gen. Millage Luke Bonham 2nd Brigade, under Brig. Gen. Richard S. Ewell 3rd Brigade, under Brig. Gen. David R. Jones 4th Brigade, under Brig. Gen. James Longstreet 5th Brigade, under Col. Philip St. George Cock 6th Brigade, under Col. Jubal Early 7th Brigade, under Col. Nathan G. Evans Reserve Brigade, under Brig. Gen. Theophilus H. Holmes The Army of the Shenandoah Brig. Gen. Joseph E. Johnston, commanding, was also organized into brigades. It consisted of four brigades of three to five infantry regiments each, which totaled approximately 12,000 men. Each brigade was assigned one artillery battery. In addition to the infantry, there were 20 pieces of artillery and about 300 Virginia cavalrymen under call. J.E.B. Stewart. Although the combined strength of both Confederate armies was about 34,000, only about 18,000 were actually engaged at first bull run. The Army of the Shenandoah consisted of four infantry brigades. 1st Brigade, commanded by Brig. Gen. Thomas J. Jackson 2nd Brigade, commanded by Col. Francis S. Bartow 3rd Brigade, commanded by Brig. Gen. Barnard E. B. 4th Brigade, commanded by Brig. Gen. Edmund Kirby Smith, Abstract Front Field Return, 1st Corps, Army of the Potomac, July 21, 1861, dated September 25, 1861. Abstract from Monthly Report of Brig. Gen. Joseph E. Johnston's Division, or Army of the Shenandoah, C. S.A., for June 30, 1861. Aggregate present for duty. Topic. Battle Topic Morning Phase Topic Matthews Hill On the morning of July 21, 1861, McDowell sent the divisions of Hunter and Heintzelman about 12,000 men from Centerville at 2.30 a.m., marching southwest on the Warrenton Turnpike and then turning northwest toward Sudley Springs. Tyler's division about 8, marched directly toward the Stone Bridge. The inexperienced units immediately developed logistical problems. Tyler's division blocked the advance of the main flanking column on the turnpike. The later units found the approach roads to Sudley Springs were inadequate, little more than a cart path in some places, and did not begin fording Bull Run until 9.30 a.m. Tyler's men reached the Stone Bridge around 6 a.m. at 5.15 a.m. Richardson's brigade fired a few artillery rounds across Mitchell's Ford on the Confederate right, some of which hit Beauregard's headquarters in the Wilmer McLean house as he was eating breakfast, alerting him to the fact that his offensive battle plan had been preempted. Nevertheless, he ordered demonstration attacks north toward the Union left at Centerville. Bungled orders and poor communications prevented their execution. Although he intended for Brig. General Richard S. Ewell to lead the attack, Ewell, at Union Mills Ford, was simply ordered to hold in readiness to advance at a moment's notice. Brig. Gen. D. R. Jones was supposed to attack in support of Ewell, but found himself moving forward alone. Holmes was also supposed to support, but received no orders at all. All that stood in the path of the 20,000 Union soldiers converging on the Confederate left flank were Col. Nathan Shanks Evans and his reduced brigade of 1,100 men. Evans had moved some of his men to intercept the direct threat from Tyler at the bridge, but he began to suspect that the weak attacks from the Union brigade of Brig. General Robert C. Shank were merely feints. He was informed of the main Union flanking movement through Sudley Springs by Captain Edward Porter Alexander, Beauregard's signal officer, observing from 8 miles 13 kilometers southwest on Signal Hill. 
In the first use of wigwag semaphore signaling in combat, Alexander sent the message, Look out for your left, your position is turned. Evans hastily led 900 of his men from their position fronting the stone bridge to a new location on the slopes of Matthews Hill, a low rise to the northwest of his previous position. The Confederate delaying action on Matthews Hill included a spoiling attack launched by Major Robert O. Wheat's 1st Louisiana Special Battalion, Wheat's Tigers. After Wheat's command was thrown back, and Wheat seriously wounded, Evans received reinforcement from two other brigades under Brig. General Barnard B. and Call. Francis S. Bardo, bringing the force on the flank to 2,800 men. They successfully slowed Hunter's lead brigade, Brig. Gen. Ambrose Burnside, in its attempts to ford Bull Run and advance across Young's Branch, at the northern end of Henry House Hill. One of Tyler's brigade commanders, Col. William Tecumseh Sherman, crossed at an unguarded ford and struck the right flank of the Confederate defenders. This surprise attack, coupled with pressure from Burnside and Maj. George Sykes, collapsed the Confederate line shortly after 11.30 a.m., sending them in a disorderly retreat to Henry House Hill. Further map details, see, additional map 4, additional map 5, additional map 6 and additional map 7. Noon phase <laughs> Henry House Hill As they retreated from their Matthews Hill position, the remainder of Evans's, B's, and Bartow's commands received some cover from Capt. John D. Imboden and his battery of four six-pounder guns, who held off the Union advance while the Confederates attempted to regroup on Henry House Hill. They were met by Generals Johnston and Beauregard, who had just arrived from Johnston's headquarters at the M. Lewis Farm, Portici. Fortunately for the Confederates, McDowell did not press his advantage and attempt to seize the strategic ground immediately, choosing to bombard the hill with the batteries of CAPTs. James B. Ricketts Battery I, 1st U.S. Artillery and Charles Griffin Battery D, 5th U.S. from Doan's Ridge. Brig. Gen. Thomas J. Jackson's Virginia Brigade came up in support of the disorganized Confederates around noon, accompanied by Col. Wade Hampton and his Hampton's Legion, and Col. J. E. B. Stewart's cavalry. The Hampton Legion, some 600 men strong, managed to buy Jackson time to construct a defensive line on Henry House Hill by firing repeated volleys at Sherman's advancing brigade. Hampton had purchased about 400 British Enfield rifles to equip the men with, however it is not clear if his troops had them at Bull Run or if the weapons arrived after the battle. If so, they would have been the only foreign-made weapons on the field. The 79th New York was thoroughly decimated by Hampton's musket fire and began to disintegrate. Wade Hampton gestured towards their colonel, James Cameron, and remarked, Look at that brave officer trying to lead his men and they won't follow him. Shortly afterwards, Cameron, the brother of U.S. Senator Simon Cameron, was fatally wounded. It has been claimed that Hampton deliberately targeted officers of the 79th New York in revenge for the death of his nephew earlier in the day, although he had in fact been killed by soldiers of the 69th New York. Jackson posted his five regiments on the reverse slope of the hill, where they were shielded from direct fire, and was able to assemble 13 guns for the defensive line, which he posted on the crest of the hill. As the guns fired, their recoil moved them down the reverse slope, where they could be safely reloaded. Meanwhile, McDowell ordered the batteries of Ricketts and Griffin to move from Doan's Ridge to the hill for close infantry support. Their 11 guns engaged in a fierce artillery duel across 300 yards 270 meters against Jackson's 13. Unlike many engagements in the Civil War, here the Confederate artillery had an advantage. The Union pieces were now within range of the Confederate smoothbores and the predominantly rifled pieces on the Union side were not effective weapons at such close ranges, with many shots fired over the head of their targets. One of the casualties of the artillery fire was Judith Carter Henry, an 85-year-old widow and invalid, who was unable to leave her bedroom in the Henry house. As Ricketts began receiving rifle fire, he concluded that it was coming from the Henry house and turned his guns on the building. A shell that crashed through the bedroom wall tore off one of the widow's feet and inflicted multiple injuries, from which she died later that day. The enemy are driving us! B exclaimed to Jackson. Jackson, a former U.S. Army officer and professor at the Virginia Military Institute, is said to have replied, Then, sir, we will give them the bayonet. B exhorted his own troops to reform by shouting, 
There is Jackson standing like a stone wall. Let us determine to die here, and we will conquer. Rally behind the Virginians." This exclamation was the source for Jackson's and his brigade's nickname, Stonewall. B was shot through the stomach shortly after speaking and died the next day, thus it is unclear exactly what he meant, moreover none of his subordinates wrote reports of the battle. Colonel States writes Gist, serving as B's aide-de-camp, took command of the brigade. Major Burnett Rhett, chief of staff to General Johnston, claimed that B was angry at Jackson's failure to come immediately to the relief of B's and Bartow's brigades while they were under heavy pressure. Those who subscribe to this opinion believe that B's statement was meant to be pejorative. Look at Jackson standing there like a stone wall. Artillery commander Griffin decided to move two of his guns to the southern end of his line, hoping to provide enfilade fire against the Confederates. At approximately 3 p.m., these guns were overrun by the 33rd Virginia, whose men were outfitted in blue uniforms, causing Griffin's commander, Maj. William F. Berry, to mistake them for Union troops and to order Griffin not to fire on them. Close-range volleys from the 33rd Virginia and Stewart's cavalry attack against the flank of the 11th New York Volunteer Infantry Regiment Ellsworth's Fire Zouaves, which was supporting the battery, killed many of the gunners and scattered the infantry. Capitalizing on this success, Jackson ordered two regiments to charge Ricketts's guns and they were captured as well. As additional Federal infantry engaged, the guns changed hands several times. The capture of the Union guns turned the tide of battle. Although McDowell had brought 15 regiments into the fight on the hill, outnumbering the Confederates two to one, no more than two were ever engaged simultaneously. Jackson continued to press his attacks, telling soldiers of the 4th Virginia Infantry, "'Reserve your fire until they come within 50 yards. Then fire and give them the bayonet. And when you charge, yell like furies.'" For the first time, Union troops heard the disturbing sound of the rebel yell. At about 4 p.m., the last Union troops were pushed off Henry House Hill by a charge of two regiments from Col. Philip St. George Cox Brigade. To the west, Chin Ridge had been occupied by Col. Oliver Otis Howard's brigade from Heinzelman's division. Also at 4 p.m., two Confederate brigades Col. Jubal Early's, which had moved from the Confederate right, and Brig. General Edmund Kirby Smith's commanded by Col. Arnold Elsey after Smith was wounded, which had just arrived from the Shenandoah Valley, crushed Howard's brigade. Beauregard ordered his entire line forward. At 5 p.m. everywhere McDowell's army was disintegrating. Thousands, in large and small groups or as individuals, began to leave the battlefield and head for Centerville. McDowell rode around the field trying to rally regiments and groups of soldiers, but most had had enough. Unable to stop the mass exodus, McDowell gave orders for Porter's regular infantry battalion, near the intersection of the Turnpike and Manassas Sudley Road, to act as a rear guard as his army withdrew. The unit briefly held the crossroads, then retreated eastward with the rest of the army. McDowell's force crumbled and began to retreat. Further map details, see, additional map 8, additional map 9, additional map 10, additional map 11 and additional map 12. Topic. Union retreat The retreat was relatively orderly up to the Bull Run crossings, but it was poorly managed by the Union officers. A Union wagon was overturned by artillery fire on a bridge spanning Cub Run Creek and incited panic in McDowell's force. As the soldiers streamed uncontrollably toward Centerville, discarding their arms and equipment, McDowell ordered call. Dixon S. Miles's division to act as a rear guard, but it was impossible to rally the army short of Washington. In the disorder that followed, hundreds of Union troops were taken prisoner. Wagons and artillery were abandoned, including the 30-pounder Parrot rifle, which had opened the battle with such fanfare. Expecting an easy Union victory, the wealthy elite of nearby Washington, including congressmen and their families, had come to picnic and watch the battle. When the Union Army was driven back in a running disorder, the roads back to Washington were blocked by panicked civilians attempting to flee in their carriages. Since their combined army had been left highly disorganized as well, Beauregard and Johnston did not fully press their advantage, despite urging from Confederate President Jefferson Davis, who had arrived on the battlefield to see the Union soldiers retreating. An attempt by Johnston to intercept the Union troops from his right flank, using the brigades of Brig. Gens. Millage L. Bonham and James Longstreet, was a failure. 
The two commanders squabbled with each other and when Bonham's men received some artillery fire from the Union rear guard, and found that Richardson's brigade blocked the road to Centerville, he called off the pursuit. In Washington President Lincoln and members of the cabinet waited for news of a Union victory. Instead, a telegram arrived stating, "'General McDowell's army in full retreat through Centerville. The day is lost. Save Washington and the remnants of this army.'" The tidings were happier in the Confederate capital. From the battlefield President Davis telegraphed Richmond, "'We have won a glorious but dear-bought victory. Night closed on the enemy in full flight and closely pursued. Aftermath. Brief observations First Bull Run was a clash between relatively large, ill-trained bodies of recruits, led by inexperienced officers. Neither army commander was able to deploy his forces effectively, although nearly 60,000 men were present at the battle, only 18,000 had actually been engaged. Although McDowell had been active on the battlefield, he had expended most of his energy maneuvering nearby regiments and brigades, instead of controlling and coordinating the movements of his army as a whole. Other factors contributed to McDowell's defeat, Patterson's failure to hold Johnston in the valley, McDowell's two-day delay at Centerville, allowing Tyler's division to lead the march on 21 July thus delaying the flanking divisions of Hunter and Heintzelman, and the two-and-a-half-hour delay after the Union victory on Matthews Hill, which allowed the Confederates to bring up reinforcements and establish a defensive position on Henry Hill. On Henry Hill Beauregard had also limited his control to the regimental level, generally allowing the battle to continue on its own and only reacting to Union moves. Johnston's decision to transport his infantry to the battlefield by rail played a major role in the Confederate victory. Although the trains were slow and a lack of sufficient cars did not allow the transport of large numbers of troops at one time, almost all of his army arrived in time to participate in the battle. After reaching Manassas Junction, Johnston had relinquished command of the battlefield to Beauregard, but his forwarding of reinforcements to the scene of fighting was decisive. Jackson and B's brigades had done the largest share of fighting in the battle. Jackson's brigade had fought almost alone for four hours and sustained over 50% casualties. Topic: <laughs> Detailed casualties. Bull Run was the largest and bloodiest battle in United States history up to that point. Union casualties were 460 killed, 1,124 wounded, and 1,312 missing or captured. Confederate casualties were 387 killed, 1,582 wounded, and 13 missing. Among the Union dead was Col. James Cameron, brother of President Lincoln's first Secretary of War, Simon Cameron. Among the Confederate casualties was Col. Francis S. Bartow, who was the first Confederate brigade commander to be killed in the Civil War. General B. was mortally wounded and died the following day. Compared to later battles, casualties at First Bull Run had not been especially heavy. Both Union and Confederate killed, wounded, and missing were a little over 1,700 each. Two Confederate brigade commanders, Jackson and Edmund Kirby Smith, were wounded in the battle. Jackson was shot in the hand, so he remained on the battlefield. No Union officers above the regimental level were killed. Two division commanders, Samuel Heintzelman and David Hunter, and one brigade commander, Orlando Wilcox, were wounded. Topic: <laughs> Union. Union casualties at the Battle of Bull Run, July 21, 1861. Union artillery lost in the Battle of Bull Run, July 21, 1861. Topic: <inaudible> Confederate. Confederate casualties at the Battle of Bull Run, July 21, 1861. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Effect on the Union and subsequent events. Union forces and civilians alike feared that Confederate forces would advance on Washington, D.C., with very little standing in their way. On July 24, Professor. 
Thaddeus S. C. Lowe ascended in the Balloon Enterprise to observe the Confederates moving in and about Manassas Junction and Fairfax. He saw no evidence of massing Confederate forces, but was forced to land in Confederate territory. It was overnight before he was rescued and could report to headquarters. He reported that his observations restored confidence to the Union commanders. The Northern public was shocked at the unexpected defeat of their army when an easy victory had been widely anticipated. Both sides quickly came to realize the war would be longer and more brutal than they had imagined. On July 22 President Lincoln signed a bill that provided for the enlistment of another 500,000 men for up to three years of service. On July 25, 11,000 Pennsylvanians who had earlier been rejected by the U.S. Secretary of War, Simon Cameron, for federal service in either Patterson's or McDowell's command arrived in Washington, D.C., and were finally accepted, three months after first Bull Run Union forces suffered another, smaller defeat at the Battle of Balls Bluff, near Leesburg, Virginia. The perceived military incompetence at First Bull Run and Ball's Bluff led to the establishment of the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, a congressional body created to investigate Northern military affairs. Concerning the Battle of First Bull Run, the committee listened to testimony from a variety of witnesses connected with McDowell's army. Although the committee's report concluded that the principal cause of defeat was Patterson's failure to prevent Johnston from reinforcing Beauregard, Patterson's enlistment had expired a few days after the battle, and he was no longer in the service. The northern public clamored for another scapegoat, and McDowell bore the chief blame. On 25 July 1861, he was relieved of Army command and replaced by Maj. General George B. McClellan, who would soon be named General-in-Chief of all the Union armies. McDowell was also present to bear significant blame for the defeat of Maj. Gen. John Pope's Army of Virginia by Gen. Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia 13 months later, at the Second Battle of Bull Run. <laughs> Effect on the Confederacy The reaction in the Confederacy was more muted. There was little public celebration as the Southerners realized that despite their victory, the greater battles that would inevitably come would mean greater losses for their side as well. Once the euphoria of victory had worn off, Jefferson Davis called for 400,000 additional volunteers. Beauregard was considered the Confederate hero of the battle and was promoted that day by C.S. President Davis to full general in the Confederate Army. Stonewall Jackson, arguably the most important tactical contributor to the victory, received no special recognition, but would later achieve glory for his 1862 Valley Campaign. Privately, Davis credited Greenhow with ensuring Confederate victory. Jordan sent a telegram to Greenhow, Our president and our general direct me to thank you. We rely upon you for further information. The Confederacy owes you a debt. Signed, Jordan, Adjutant General. The battle also had long-term psychological consequences. The decisive victory led to a degree of overconfidence on the part of Confederate forces, while prompting a determined organizational effort on the part of the Union. In hindsight commentators on both sides agreed that the one-sided outcome proved the greatest misfortune that would have befallen the Confederacy. Although modern historians generally agree with this interpretation, James M. McPherson has argued that the esprit de corps attained by Confederate troops on the heels of their victory, together with a new sense of insecurity felt by Northern commanders, also gave the Confederacy a military edge in the following months. <laughs> Confederate victory, turning point of the American Civil War Bull Run versus Manassas The name of the battle has caused controversy since 1861. The Union Army frequently named battles after significant rivers and creeks that played a role in the fighting. The Confederates generally used the names of nearby towns or farms. The U.S. National Park Service uses the Confederate name for its National Battlefield Park, but the Union name Bull Run also has widespread currency in popular literature. <laughs> Confusion between the battle flags Battlefield confusion between the battle flags, especially the similarity of the Confederacy's stars and bars 
and the Union's stars and stripes, when fluttering, led to the adoption of the Confederate battle flag, which eventually became the most popular symbol of the Confederacy and the South in general. Topic. Conclusions First Bull Run demonstrated that the war would not be won by one grand battle, and both sides began preparing for a long and bloody conflict. The battle also showed the need for adequately trained and experienced officers and men. One year later many of the same soldiers who had fought at First Bull Run, now combat veterans, would have an opportunity to test their skills on the same battlefield at the Second Battle of Bull Run, Manassas. Topic. Additional battle maps Topic. Gallery, the first bull run hour by hour Topic. In popular culture The first battle of Bull Run is mentioned in the novel Gods and Generals, but is depicted more fully in its film adaptation. The battle forms the climax of the film class of 61. It also appears in the first episode of the second season of the miniseries North and South, in the second episode of the first season of the miniseries How the West Was Won and in the first episode of the miniseries The Blue and the Grey. Manassas 1999 is the first volume in the James Reasoner Civil War series of historical novels. The battle is described in Rebel 1993, the first volume of Bernard Cornwell's The Starbuck Chronicles series of historical novels. The battle is described from the viewpoint of a Union infantryman in Upton Sinclair's novella Manassas, which also depicts the political turmoil leading up to the Civil War. The battle is also depicted in John Jakes's The Titans, the fifth novel in the Kent Family Chronicles, a series that explores the fictional Confederate cavalry officer Gideon Kent. The battle is the subject of the Johnny Horton song, Battle of Bull Run. Shaman, second in the Cole family trilogy by Noah Gordon, includes an account of the battle. The battle is also depicted in the song, Yankee Bayonet, by indie folk band The Decemberists. In Murder at 1600, Detective Harlan Regis Wesley Snipes has built a plan relief of the battle which plays a certain role in the plot. Sesquicentennial Prince William County staged special events commemorating the 150th anniversary of the Civil War through 2011. Manassas was named the number one tourist destination in the United States for 2011 by the American Bus Association for its efforts in highlighting the historical impact of the Civil War. The cornerstone of the commemoration event featured a reenactment of the battle on July 23 to 24, 2011. Throughout the year, there were tours of the Manassas battlefield and other battlefields in the county and a number of related events and activities. The city of Manassas commemorated the 150th anniversary of the battle July 21 to 24, 2011. Topic: <laughs> Battlefield Preservation. Part of the site of the battle is now Manassas National Battlefield Park, which is designated as a National Battlefield Park. More than 900,000 people visit the battlefield each year in comparison, 22 million people visited nearby Washington, D.C. in 2016. As a historic area under the National Park Service, the park was administratively listed on the National Register of Historic Places on October 15, 1966. See also Second Battle of Bull Run Armies in the American Civil War Troop engagements of the American Civil War, 1861 List of costliest American Civil War land battles Origins of the American Civil War Battle of Fort Sumter Manassas Campaign Manassas National Battlefield Park Bull Run Mountains Commemoration of the American Civil War on postage stamps Notes <laughs> <laughs>